Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Uh, Welcome to week number two of a series we're calling My Blank Family. And we're talking about families. And so looking at several different stories of families that you find in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. And we're asking, what does God have to say about our families? What What does the Bible have to say about that? So if you were here last week with us, we started the series by talking about a family, uh, Abraham and Sarah. And we talked about what does it mean to have a divided family? How does God want to speak into that? Today we're talking about my manipulative family. That's what we're going to be discussing. Have you ever noticed every family seems to have a black sheep of the family? Have you noticed this? Every family has like that person who's sort of on the outs, that that black sheep of the family. And by the way, right now if you're sitting there going, my family doesn't have a black sheep, it's because it's you. You are the black sheep of your family, right? In fact, for some of you, this is you at Thanksgiving here in a couple weeks. This is exactly how you're going to feel with your family at Thanksgiving. And if you're the type you're sitting there saying, well, I might be the black sheep, but those other sheep aren't as white as you think they are. That is a total black sheep thing to say. It's just a dead giveaway that you are the black sheep of your family if you say stuff like that. Okay, so, so there, in every family there, are, there is a black sheep. Also in most families there is a golden child as well, right? The ideal, the favorite the one that we love to hate, the one that, that, that makes us proud. In fact, if you're sitting next to a golden child right now, just throw an elbow at them, will you? Just go ahead right now, yeah. Man, you guys took that way too seriously. <laughs> this is like, this is great. It's stirring up all kinds of junk already early on in the sermon. That's awesome. Today, uh, the family story that we're, <laughs> we're looking at today, there are two children, and there is a very clear black sheep, and there is a very clear golden child in this family story. So last week, we talked about Abraham and Sarah, and eventually Abraham and Sarah do have a child. His name is Isaac, and Isaac is the child of the promise. He's the child of the blessing that the nation of Israel is going to come from. And then eventually, uh, Isaac marries Rebekah, and Isaac and Rebekah have two twin boys, and their names are... Jacob and Esau, twin boys, but at the moment of their birth, Esau is born first. And so Esau is the golden child. He is the firstborn. But as as Esau is being born, his brother Jacob grasps the heel of his brother as he's literally coming out and being born. And so his parents, when they see that, they say, oh, this second child, he clearly, he was grasping the heel of his brother. He was trying to be the firstborn. And so they give him the name Jacob. And the name Jacob in the Hebrew literally means grasps the heel. That's what the name means. But a better understanding of it in our language today would be manipulator, weasel. That's what they name him. They name their child. They say he is Jacob. He is the manipulator. He is the weasel. That's the identity. That's what they speak to him when, at the moment of his birth. And so Esau is the golden child, and Jacob grows up with this identity of I am not Esau. That's who I am. I'm not Esau, I am manipulator, I am the weasel, that's who I am. And so we're gonna intersect their story. Genesis chapter 27 is uh, the place where we're gonna pick up the story here. Isaac is old now, and he's going blind, he's at the end of his life, and so the time has come to decide who's gonna go next in the family, who's gonna carry on the family name, how are things gonna be divided up after he passes away? Genesis 27, starting in verse one, says this. One day when Isaac was old and turning blind, he called for Esau, his older son, and said, my son. Yes, father, Esau replied. I am an old man now, Isaac said, and I don't know, that, I don't know when I may die. Take your bow and a quiver of, full of arrows and go out into the open country to hunt some wild game for me. There's several people not at church today because they're doing just that. Um, prepare my favorite dish and bring it here for me to eat. Then I will pronounce the blessing that belongs to you, my firstborn son, before I die. But Rebekah overheard what Isaac had said to his son Esau. So when Esau left to hunt for the wild game, she said to her son Jacob, listen, I overheard your father say to Esau, bring me some wild game and prepare me a delicious meal. Then I will bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. Now, my son, listen to me. Do exactly as I tell you. Go out to the flocks and bring me two fine young goats. I'll use them to prepare your father's favorite dish. 
Then take the food to your father so he can eat it and bless you before he dies. Now, what's happening here is a major pivotal moment in the story of Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Esau. And and it all revolves around this ritual that would have happened in ancient families in the the ancient Near East. And so to explain it a little bit, uh, the, the term we use would be primogeniture. Primogeniture means that the oldest son, the eldest son in the family had a birthright and that oldest son, because of the birthright, he would be given a blessing by his father and what that meant is that when his father died, he would inherit the lead position in the family and he would, he would inherit the overwhelming majority of the wealth and he would be looked at as the lead prime person in his family, the oldest son, that's how it worked. Now, the way that this blessing would get transferred, the way that this would all get set up, would there, there would be a very public family ritual. So all the family be, would be invited, uh, extended family, everybody would be there, and there would be this moment where what the father would do is he would put his hand on his eldest son and he would verbally speak a blessing to his son. Now, why that's so important and why it was such an important ritual is because in that culture, in that day, the spoken word was binding. So you gotta understand, there were no legal written contracts in that day, no, no uh, you know, paper that they would write down and sign a contract on or have a trust or whatever. And so the, the, the verbal word was actually binding. So when the father spoke that blessing over his oldest son, that was it. That could not be taken back. It could not be reversed. Once it had been spoken, that was it. The deed was done. And that son would inherit the lead position in the family. And so what's happening here in this moment is Isaac, you know, is having sort of this private moment with his son Esau, and he says, hey, Esau, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bless you. I want you to go out and hunt some, some game and bring it back to me. Now, what he's doing is he's kind of doing this manipulative move here. He's not inviting the whole family. He's not bringing everyone together. He's kind of trying to do this off, you know, one-off over here in private, which should clue you in a little bit to the family dynamics here. What happens is Rebecca hears, she overhears what Isaac is planning to do And so she comes up with this manipulative plan. It's not Jacob who comes up with this plan. It's his manipulative mother who actually comes up with this whole plan. And she says, here, while Esau is out, I'm gonna cook some goats and I want you to go into your father's presence with a meal and pretend to be Esau. And that's exactly what happens. Jacob walks in with the food while Esau is out hunting. And Isaac, who is blind, says, who is this? Which one of my sons is this? And he lies and he says, I'm Esau. And so in that moment, Isaac puts his hand on his son Jacob, thinking it's Esau, and pronounces the blessing over his son Jacob. And when that happens, everything blows up in this family. Everything just explodes. And so the thread of this that runs through this storyline, and I think the thread that still runs through our families today is this idea that we search for identity from our family of origin. All of us, we search for our sense of identity from our family of origin that we're born into, uh, usually from our earthly fathers, actually. And so it's not like a physical blessing, you know, in our culture where there's a laying on of hands and a spoken word blessing. It's not that way, but we all want to know what it means to belong. We, we, We wanna know who we are. We wanna know what it means to live out the family name. We all look for that. We search for our identity from our families of origin. When you think about your family, some of you were given a great gift of identity from your family of origin. Your family spoke life over you. They taught you who you were. You understood what it meant to live out the family name. Others of you are more like Jacob and Your family made you feel like you had to earn something to belong. You had to prove yourself in some way if you wanted to be accepted. And so you you spent your life trying to figure out how to be what your family wanted you to be in order to earn or attain your identity. Still others of you in this room, your family of origin was so broken and so dysfunctional that they didn't give you any sense of identity, good or bad. And so what happened to you is you had to go looking outside of your family of origin to try to figure out who you were, to try to figure out what your identity was. And so things in life became your identity that maybe they shouldn't have been, like your work, your job, money, 
a sense of wealth or position, sex, relationships, those things became an identity for you. Those, that's where you sought out purpose and meaning for your life that established you, this is who I am. And here, here's what I want you to see with that. Whether you came from a great family, whether you came from a, a broken family, whatever you know, is your situation, your family of origin, we all, every single one of us, we figure out how to become what we need to become in order to survive. In order to live out the identity that we've given, we all kind of figure out how to manipulate our situation, manipulate the context and manipulate the relationships that we encounter in our world in order to survive, in order to become who it is that we think we're supposed to become. And so this idea I want us to understand today is that manipulation is a learned survival skill. That's what it is. Manipulation is a learned survival skill. We learn how to manipulate. No one is a born manipulator. Contrary to the story here that we're reading, Jacob isn't born a manipulator. At the moment of his birth, his parents give him that name. You are Weasel. You are Jacob. You're the manipulator. That's who you are. But then it's actually not Jacob. It's his mom and dad. It's the manipulation that's going on between the two of them. That's what actually he learns how to live into. That's where he learns how to manipulate and that's the identity eventually that he takes on. By the way, when it, what the Bible really does is the Bible gives us these stories of families not so that we can emulate them. When people will say to me like, man, I just, I just wanna have a more biblical family. I'm like, have you read the Bible? <laughs> The, the, the stories we're given of these families in the Bible are not like, the, we're not given like the ideal families that we're supposed to emulate and be like. These are all failure stories. Every one of these family stories are failure stories that are meant to point to something or someone else that we don't yet see in the story. And so Jacob learns how to manipulate. We learn how to manipulate the context that we're in in order to become what we need to become so that we can survive. Manipulation is not something you're born with. You don't do it because you're a bad person. You do it because you are a person. It's what we all do. A weasel doesn't know he's a weasel. He just knows what it takes to get food, right? And so that's Jacob's story. He grows up and he starts to learn how to manipulate. Donald Miller wrote a book a few years ago called Scary Close. Some of you have probably read it. But it's all about relationships. And in that book, he talks about several different kinds of manipulators that we see in our families, and we see in our world. And uh, I'm, gonna go, I'm gonna give you just three of them, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but these are the three that you commonly see. And so in, in this book, Donald Miller talks about these different kind of manipulators. The first one he talks about is the scorekeeper. And the scorekeeper's big phrase is, I did the dishes, I expect you to do the laundry. Right, And so that this person is always keeping score. Now, there's no winner and no loser in the family, but it doesn't matter. The scorekeeper keeps score anyway. Well, I did these three things. Now, it's on you to do these three things. That is a form of manipulation. That's what that is. Another kind of manipulator he talks about is the fear monger. This person uses fear and intimidation to control family members and to get what they want. The main question the fear monger is always asking is, are you loyal to me? Are you loyal to me or not? That's what they wanna know. And their main idea is submit to me or be destroyed. And then they're always wondering, they're always testing and asking, are you loyal to me? No matter what I do, no matter how I act, are you still loyal to me? And if you're not, that is a form of manipulation. Fear and intimidation tear families apart. Another kind he identifies in there is the flopper. Some of you are NBA fans. You're familiar with this term. The flopper, uh, the main thing they say is, you hurt me, now you owe me. Okay, this person is a false victim. Now, there, there are true victims. There are real victims in our world, people who have uh, suffered abuse uh, or who have been hurt, and they are truly victims. That's not what this person is. This is a false victim. This person is all about, they're obsessed with the ways they've been hurt or injured, and they use that as leverage to get you to do and feel guilty and do what they want. The flopper is, loves to tell their story. They'll tell their story of how they've been hurt to anybody and everybody who will listen so that then they kinda can use that as leverage against the person to get them to do what they want. That is a form of manipulation. We, we could go on and on and on uh, with these, but do we do this? Maybe you're sitting there right now and you're like, oh my gosh, that's me right there. Or maybe you're sitting there going, that's um, so-and-so right there. That's what they do. 
Here, here's what I want you to see with this. None of these things are your true identity. None of them. And then that person who does that in your family, that's not their true identity. They learned how to do that in order to survive. Usually we pick up this stuff and we learn it from our families of origin. It's, it's not our true identity. It's not who God really called us to be and how he called us to relate in our relationships. That's what we learned how to do at a certain place in order to survive, in order to get our needs met, in order to become what we thought we needed to be. That's what we learned how to do. And you know what? It actually serves us at some level in our lives. That's why we do it. We wouldn't keep doing it if it didn't work for us at some level. But as life goes on and relationships continue and families, it, it always breaks down. It always falls apart. And that's what you see in this story. What's sad about this story is that neither one of these two boys are gifted with their true identity from their family. Not Esau, not Jacob. Neither one of them really received their true identity from their family. And so what happens is out of this blessing, Jacob gets the blessing, he steals the blessing from his father, Isaac, and he goes on to become the father of the nation of Israel. Uh, he, he becomes the father. So Jacob was the second born son and Isaac was also the second born son of Abraham and the blessing goes through him. Esau goes on to become the father of the Edomites, another great people in the Old Testament. And what you see is these two great people groups, Israel and Edom, all throughout the story of the Old Testament, they continue to have war and fighting and all kinds of problems between them. But in their immediate family, what happens is Esau is so angry at Jacob for what he does, for the way he manipulates the situation and steals the blessing, that things just continue to get worse and worse in their family until finally Esau starts talking and saying, I'm gonna kill Jacob. I'm just looking for my opportunity, I'm gonna kill him. And so Rebecca, the manipulative mom, she, she makes another manipulative move in the story. Instead of sitting down and saying, we need to talk, we need to resolve this, we need to work through this, she comes up with this plan and she sends Jacob off to live with her brother Laban in Haran. So Jacob leaves the family, he, he leaves everything he's known and he goes to live with his uncle Laban and there his uncle Laban manipulates him and uncle Laban tricks him into marrying his daughter Leah. He wanted to marry Rachel and what Laban is doing here is he, it's a manipulative move to try to keep Jacob working for him and, and keep control over Jacob and keep him working in his family business for as long as he possibly can. What Jacob does in response to that is that he manipulates Laban back. He literally steals all his flocks and herds. He steals his business right out from under him. He eventually does marry Rachel as well. And then he leaves. He takes Uncle Laban's business and leaves and goes off on his own. And so you, you look at this story and you're like, wow. I mean, it almost appears like, man, Jacob is on top. Like he's managed to outmaneuver and outmanipulate everybody in his family. Like he's the king. He's, he's got it rolling for himself. But if you read the story, what you realize is that plays itself out to the point where Jacob eventually finds himself completely and totally alone, which is what always happens when we live out the learned path of manipulation that we've learned from our, our childhood. It always ends with us being broken and alone. Jacob his entire story is about manipulating others and being manipulated. His entire life revolves around this. He became what he had to be to survive. He lives up to his name. And then eventually it burns every relationship in his life and until he finds himself alone. That's what we do. Manipulation may have been a learned survival skill. You may have figured out, man, this is how I can get my needs met. This is how I can survive. And it may have worked for you. But if we play it out in our families over the long haul, eventually it's not our true identity. It's not the way God called us to live. And we burn every single relationship and finally we find ourselves alone. Jacob, finally, years later in his life, after manipulating everybody, one night he finds himself in this really difficult position. His brother Esau has finally tracked him down and found him. And now Esau has an entire army. Esau is on his way coming to kill Jacob. And Jacob can't run this way and get away because on this side, Uncle Laban is closing in and he's got a whole arm. These are his family members. And he's got a whole army and they're coming for the same purpose. They're coming to kill him. And so Jacob one night finds himself in this place where he's completely alone, completely isolated from his family. And it's at that moment that God finally intersects Jacob's story. And he meets with God. And what happens is one of the most powerful exchanges in the entire Bible what happens is God himself appears in, in human form to Jacob 
And we, the big fancy word for this, we call this a theophany. All a theophany is, a theophany is an appearance in the Old Testament of the pre-incarnate Christ. So this is Christ before he was incarnated as Jesus later in the New Testament. So God himself appears to Jacob in this moment as he's by this river and, and he's, the, his family is closing in to kill him on either side and he's utterly alone. God shows up. And what happens is Jacob, in this sort of comical thing, Jacob wrestles with God all night long. And the thing we're supposed to understand from that is like Jacob thinks he can even outmaneuver God. Do we do that as well? We, we learn how to manipulate and then we kind of apply that to God and we say, well, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna wrestle with God. I'm gonna manipulate God into meeting my needs, giving me what I want. And so all night long, he, he wrestles with God. He tries to outmaneuver God. He literally thinks he can do that because that's how he's learned to do everything in his life. And he can't get the upper hand. He can't seem to win. And so finally, in this powerful exchange in Genesis 32, verse 26, then the man, this is, this is uh, God, says, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Stop. This is so powerful, you guys. Why? Does God ask him that question? Who else in the story did Jacob ask for a blessing? His earthly father, Isaac, right? So what's happening here in this moment? He wrestles with God all night trying to outmaneuver him. He's, and he, he managed to outmaneuver his father in, into getting a blessing. But what's happened is apparently the blessing he got from his father didn't fix him. It didn't solve the problem. It didn't give him, he's still searching for his identity. He's still searching for it. He's still trying to find it. And so with God, he says, I won't let you go until you bless me. Look at how God responds. The man asked him, what is your name? Why does he ask Jacob that question? Because the last time Jacob was searching for a blessing and the last time he was asked that question, he said what? I'm Esau. He lied. He manipulated. This is so powerful. What God is doing here in this moment with Jacob is he's taking Jacob back to this wounded episode in his life. He's taking him back to this moment of brokenness where it all really unhinged for him and where it all began to this moment where he manipulated and lied to try to get what he wanted and, and became that identity that he was given. And God takes him back to that moment. It's like a second chance moment in Jacob's life. And God is saying, you are not who I created you to be. This is what you've learned how to do, how to survive. You are not who I created you to be. What is your name? And in this powerful moment, he answers, Jacob. I don't know how you guys read these stories. Like the way I picture this moment unfolding, I, I picture literally when he says, what is your name? I picture Jacob, like this is the moment where he just breaks. This is the moment where he just falls apart. I picture him screaming, at like, I'm Jacob. I, I, that's how I imagine it. It's like he finally gets it right. He finally is able to, own. I'm not Esau. I'm not these, this thing my family wanted me to be. I'm not in control as much as I think I, I'm just Jacob. That's all I am. I'm Jacob, that's all I can be. And he, it's like the first moment in his life where he just owns up to it before God, that's who I am. Look at what God does next. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with human beings and have overcome. The name Israel means God struggles. See what's happening in, in this moment. God changes his name. Weasel, manipulator, that's the name he was given by his family. That's the identity he had been living into all that point in his life. And in this moment, God says, Jacob, you are no longer going to be identified by your past. You're gonna be no longer defined by that. I'm giving you a new identity. I'm giving you a new future, a new name. And it's the name of the promise of the future nation and the future of salvation that I'm gonna bring. Now, the reason this is such a huge, pivotal moment in the entire Old Testament, in the big picture of the big story of Scripture, the reason this is such a, a, an incredibly powerful moment is that Jacob's life is a story about Jacob. He steals a blessing from his father, and then he goes on to have 12 sons eventually, and those 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus comes along in the New Testament 
And Jesus doesn't steal a blessing from his heavenly father. Jesus receives a blessing from his heavenly father. In Matthew chapter three, at the moment of Jesus' baptism, he's coming out of the water. In Matthew three, a voice from heaven, his heavenly father says, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. That's Jesus' true identity. That's who he is. The heavenly father says, this is my son whom I love. In him, I am well pleased. Jesus goes on to have 12 disciples and those 12 disciples become the fathers of the church that carries the gospel message of salvation to the whole world. Here's how that applies to you and to me. Here's why that matters for your family. Whatever way of manipulation you have learned, it was a survival skill. It, was, it became, here's how, what I need to become so that I can survive. Whatever that is, when we come to Jesus and when we put our trust and our faith in Jesus, we are gifted a new identity. We are gifted the same identity that Jesus was gifted by his heavenly father through our faith and our trust in him. Through, our, through Christ, through our faith and trust in Jesus, we have the same identity as Jesus. We can hear the heavenly father say, this is my son. This is my daughter whom I love and in whom I am well pleased. That's your true identity. And when you begin to experience that, when you begin to embrace that and live out of that true identity, it, it will transform every relationship in your life. You can't live on the skills of manipulation you've, dis, you've found. You can only live long-term out of your true identity in Christ. That's who you are for all of eternity. This is my son, this is my daughter, in his, whom I love and in whom I am well pleased. This idea has transformed my life. It's transformed my family. Uh, something I say to my, my wife and I have four boys, something I say to my boys all the time. In fact, I don't even know if they realize how often I say it to them because I've just been saying it for so many years, but I will regularly say to my boys, I love being around you. I, I love being around you. I say that all the time. My oldest son, Alan, he's 18. He's still living at home, but working and, and uh, going to college and stuff. And so, I, you know what, late at night is kind of like the only time I have to connect with him anymore. I'll see him late at night. He'll just be getting home from work or be studying for some project. And I'll stay up. And if I get even like 10 minutes or whatever to talk with him late at night, I'll end the conversation. I'll just be like, I'm so glad I, get to talk, I got to talk to you tonight. I love being around you. I love when I get to be around you. Each one of my boys, I, since the time they were little, I've been taking them on these things I call day away with dad, D-A-W-D, a -A dawd. If you ask any of my boys what a dawd is, they can tell you what that is. I, I take these days where I'll just say the whole day is yours and they get to plan the day and we go do whatever they want and, then, and we just go, we just have a blast spending time together because I want my boys to know I love being around you. For each one of my boys, when they've turned 13, they've gotten to plan a special trip and so it's their trip, they get to plan it we, we plan it together and I'll foot the bill. I'll pay a ridiculous amount of money if I have to and we will just go and we will take this entire trip together because I want them to know I love being around you. Last summer, I was with my youngest son, John, who's 11 and we were doing a day away with dad and we were going and we were doing the, the things that he wanted to do and uh, I started to notice, he, he started saying, dad, I'm sorry, this is so boring and then we go to, to the next thing that he wanted to do. And he'd say, Dad, I'm sorry. This is, I know this is really boring for you. And I, I started to realize what was going on. Like, oh, he thinks, he thinks I'm bored. He thinks that going around doing the things that he wants to do is somehow boring to me. And so I stopped him. And I said, John, are you kidding me? I said, I couldn't possibly be bored when I'm with you. I love being around you. I couldn't possibly be bored. That comes from a place of brokenness in my past, in my history. From 12 years old on, my dad has been a great father to me. I love my dad. We have a great relationship at this point in life. But earlier on in my life, uh, I've shared this before, my dad 
wasn't home. He worked incessantly. He was gone on the road, traveling all the time. He would come home just for a very short amount of time and get right back on the road. And honestly, I look at that now, I think a lot of it was he just didn't know what to do, didn't know how to engage with his family. And he went through his own transformation story. But I literally, I don't know, I was maybe seven or eight. I remember this happening regularly. Uh, I was around that age and I remember it would be like the day. My dad had been gone all week. And I, I can literally, in my mind's eye, I can see the door of our uh, our front door of our family. I remember looking at the door. I'm a kid. Like, I'm staring at this door. I can't wait. I'm, I can't wait for my dad to get home. I know he's coming home. I know he's on his way home. And I remember just staring at that door, waiting. And then finally, the moment would come, and he'd walk in that front door. And what would happen is he would put his stuff down, and he would immediately just walk to the very back room of the house and shut the door and lock it. My parents had this room, like in part of their bedroom in the very back, and he'd just go in and shut that door and lock it. And I would start to go down the hallway, and my mom would say, don't don't bother your dad. He's tired. Don't go in there. Just leave him alone. And I remember how badly I wanted to go in that room, how badly I wanted to turn that knob and open that door and hear my dad say, Brian, great to see you. I love being around you. And here's the thing. I'm not mad at my dad for that. My dad's gone through his own transformation and his own story. My dad can't go back now and give me what he didn't give me then. The only place I can get it is from my heavenly father, through Christ, through Jesus. That's the only place I can go to get healing and wholeness. And so as I've pursued Jesus, as he's begun to speak into that area and that wound, my job begins to turn and live out this new identity. This is my son, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible is uh, Hebrews 4.16. You know what Hebrews 4.16 says? It says, because of Jesus, I can now go boldly into the throne room of my heavenly father to receive grace and mercy to help me in my time of need. That speaks directly to me, my friends. Because of Jesus, because of, of that identity transferred to me through Jesus, I can now, I can go boldly, into the, I can open that door, I can walk in, and I can go boldly into the presence of my Heavenly Father, and he's not gonna say, what is the matter with you? You're, you're such a disappointment to me. Why are you disturbing me? But when I go into the, the presence of my Heavenly Father, I will find grace and mercy to help me in my time of need, whatever that time of need is. So that's begun to transform my life. And so I turn and with that identity, I begin to live that identity out to my wife and to my boys and to my family. And on my good days, I do exactly that. I live into that identity and I am a great father. And on my bad days, I'm not. And I, and I live into these other patterns it's not perfect. You're not ever there totally. But I keep coming back to the person of Jesus. I keep allowing him to, to instill, this is my son whom I love and whom I am well pleased. That's my true identity. That's who he's called me to be. That's who I live out of. I told you all of that so I could tell you this. This is the bottom line. You cannot love your family well until you have first been loved well. And my friends, there is only one who loves well. There's only one who knows how to do that. Even if you came from the best family possible, you learned how to manipulate and survive and become whatever it is you thought you needed to become. That might have served you at a time. It won't serve you forever. The only way we can love our families well, the only way we can love our spouses well, love our parents well, love our, our children well, is to allow Jesus to actually love you, to actually transform you. Unless you do that, until you get to that point where you fully surrender your life to him, where you own up, I'm, I'm just who I am. I can't be something else my family wants me to be. I can't be what anybody else wants me to be. Until we come to that place and we let him fully love us and fully restore us, all we're gonna do is, is just manipulate. We're just gonna continue to manipulate to our own ends to try to survive. And eventually it will burn every relationship that you have and you will find yourself alone. And that's not your true identity. That's not what he has for you. That's not what he wants you to be in your family. Black sheep or golden child, whichever one you are, 
you've just learned how to manipulate, not because you're a bad human, but because you are a human. It's what we do. All of us have to come to the same, the same place where we say, Jesus, the only identity that works is the one gifted to me through you. Jesus, death on the cross was every bit as much for you as it was for me. And he, he loved us to that extent. He loved us that well. And until we've allowed his love to completely transform and penetrate our lives, we have no hope within ourselves to just be good on our own, to just love well on our own. We'll just continue to create more and more cycles of manipulation and brokenness. But God can intersect your family and he can break that cycle. You're not gonna be perfect. On bad days, you'll be the old version of yourself. But it's not, but you'll know that's not who I am for all of eternity. And that's what lasts. That's what transforms family. And so here's how I want to end right now. I want to do exactly what Hebrews 4, 16 says. I want to go boldly. I want to invite you to go boldly into the throne room of of your heavenly father. Through Jesus, through your relationship with Jesus, I want to invite you to go boldly in the throne room of your heavenly father to receive grace and mercy to help you in your time of need. Are you in a time of need? Is your family in a time of need? Would you bow your heads with me? I'm just gonna leave some space right now. Maybe you need to have a a moment like Jacob had right now with the father where you just need to go before him and you need to just own up and say, this is who I am. I'm done hiding. I'm I'm done trying to manipulate you, God. I'm done trying to manipulate others. And just surrender yourself to him. Own up to the fact that you can't fix it, you can't solve yourself and let him fully love you, fully embrace you and completely and totally save you. Ask him to give you your true identity. every one of us. We figured out how to survive. We figured out how to become what we needed to become. Lord, we figured out how to manipulate to our own ends. And we confess, God, there's many even times where we've just tried to manipulate you. We're mad that we can't outmaneuver you and get the upper hand. We just come this morning and we just recognize you have an identity for us that's so much better than that. You want a gift to us through your salvation. So we thank you this morning for the cross. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for the new hope and the life that we have in you. We thank you that in in you, we are your sons. We are your daughters. And you are well pleased with us. You love us. God, would you allow us to begin to live out of that identity? Would you allow us to begin to turn and to live out of that? There's nothing to gain. There's nothing to lose. There's nothing to prove. There's nothing to manipulate. There's just living into that identity. Would you allow us to be that? And I pray, God, that that would begin to transform our homes. It would begin to transform our kids. It would begin to transform our parents. It would begin to transform our marriages and our world. God, would you do your work in us? Would you love us well so that we can be able to show others that love? It's in Jesus' name we pray and everybody said.